let's practice a couple more proofs by induction. This time we'll work with subtraction. Let's prove that n minus n equals zero. An obvious arithmetic fact to you and I, but to cock it's something that needs to be proved. And furthermore, I'll remind you, cock does not think about natural numbers the same way you and I do. We learn to think about them in school. They're deeply instilled in our brains. To cock, this is just a data type, the nat data type, and we're just doing proofs by induction about code involving that type. We defined the plus operation before. We defined the minus operation. We're just doing proofs about how the function minus is implemented. OK, let's get started with that. Uh, we just need to see our proof goal. There we are. We'll introduce n to get started off. Now we want to prove that n minus n equals 0. You might recall the minus operator, like the plus operator, is defined to recurse on its left-hand argument. There is nothing that is known about that arbitrary natural number n here, so we definitely need some kind of case analysis. And in fact, we're going to need induction, as it turns out. Now, recognizing when you need induction is something that takes some time to learn, uh, and there's not an, uh, like a, a guiding algorithm I can give you to say this is how you will always know that you need uh, proof by induction. Uh, but the fact that the minus operation is implemented recursively is going to be a pretty good clue here. Right? Um, it also depends on the theorem you're trying to prove. For very simple theorems, you maybe don't even need to exploit that fact. But here we will. So let's do induction. Now we learned some syntax for, it, for this in the previous lecture, uh, in the previous video. I'm going to do a simpler syntax here so we can play with it, and then we'll build back up. I could just say induction n just to say that I want to do induction on that term n. Uh, and that mostly does exactly what we had before. We get two cases, one for the zero, one for the successor. Now, the things I didn't do was to introduce that or to give that intros pattern. Uh, that intros pattern gave names for the piece of data carried by the successor constructor and the inductive hypothesis. As it turns out, you leave out the intros pattern and Cock will choose those names for you. It does an OK job sometimes of picking names, in fact. Let's see what it did in this case. First off, we need to get past the base case. Uh, that should be solvable just with reflexivity, because remember, that's going to fully compute the terms on each side. In fact, 0 minus 0 will compute to 0, because minus is defined to be 0 if its left-hand argument is 0. So that goes past quickly. In the second case, now we can take a look. Cock chose names. It chose n for the number inside of yeah, n. This is why sometimes we would prefer to choose our own names here, just to make it clear to our human brains that we're actually dealing with a different natural number n here than we were up at the top of the proof. So uh, I could say as n prime here, if I like, for the intros pattern. To me, that's clearer. Your mileage may vary. But now I can see I'm dealing with a successor of n prime, where n prime here is that smaller natural number. Well, I didn't name the inductive hypothesis this time, and yet I got the name ihn prime. Because as it turns out, Cock will automatically choose the name ih followed by the name of the term that it was instantiated on. So since we were instantiating the inductive hypothesis on n prime here, that's what it chose. If we had said that we wanted this to be named k or something else like that, Right, so now we've got k as a natural number, and we've got the inductive hypothesis for k, which is that k minus k equals 0. OK, you can do it either way. Hey, let's, let's stick with k for now. All right, so as we did before, we can notice that we've got a minus sign here, and that's really the minus function. And if we think about the minus function, we know that it's implemented to pattern match on its left argument and would, would in fact simplify if its left argument was a successor of some other number. So simple is going to work there. That's how we can think about it in our heads to think through the fact that it should work. Of course, when you're first learning cock, sometimes it's difficult to keep all of that in your head. No problem. It's totally fine to try out simple and see what happens. That will help you build up your intuition about what simple does, when it works, and when it doesn't. OK, now we've got something that looks like the inductive hypothesis. We've got k minus k here and k minus k here. 
Uh, by the way, you might notice, in fact, that the inductive hypothesis is exactly the goal that we're trying to prove here. We're going to see later on tactics for handling that kind of situation. Uh, for now, uh, let me just briefly skip ahead and say, in fact, you could say prove that by assumption. The thing you're trying to prove has already been assumed as part of the hypotheses. That would totally work as well. OK, but we're, that's 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 looking a little bit ahead for now. Uh, based on the tactics that Software Foundations has already introduced, rewrite would work, though. We could replace the k minus k with 0 in the goal. So we want to rewrite going from the left to the right with ihk. Great, we've got 0 equals 0 at that point. Uh, by the way, left to right is the default order, so you can, in fact, leave that out if you wish. It's only if you want to go from right to left that you actually really do need to write it. OK, now we've got 0 equals 0. Well, that follows by reflexivity. Great. And now we've finished that proof. Now, you might go back to here and ask yourself, did I really need to do simple here? Like, could I have left that out? Well, take a look at what's going on here. Uh, if you want to rewrite with IHK at this point, you need to have something of the form k minus k showing up in the goal. But being very syntactically literal here, there is no k minus k appearing there. There are successor constructors that are getting in the way. So if we try to rewrite with that, we're going to say, get an error here that says, found no subterm matching k minus k. So the simple really was necessary there. That finishes that proof. Let's try another one. Let's prove that add is a commutative operation. For any two natural numbers, n and m, if we add them together, uh, it doesn't matter which order. n plus m equals m plus n. Actually, it's really tricky to say n and m and distinguish them every single time in a way that's easy to hear. So you know what? I'm going to change that to a and b. a plus b equals b plus a. Hopefully those sound more distinct. OK, to get started on that, this is going to be another proof by induction. So let's introduce both of those variables, a and b. Sorry, Emacs is trying to keep more of the screen visible for me, but it's doing a bad job at this point of picking exactly which parts of the screen should be visible. Uh, I'll remind you, the reason this is happening is because I've made the font size huge for sake of these videos. When you're doing this on your own screen, this shouldn't be so much of a problem. OK. Now, we have a choice at this point of which to do induction on. Do we want to do induction on a, or do we want to do induction on b? This is another thing that can take some time to get used to figuring out in Coq. Uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, you want to do induction on whichever variable is going to be pattern matched on. For example, in the plus operation here, we know that, in fact, the plus function that it's defined based on uh, is really going to pattern match on the left-hand argument. Now, in the case of this theorem, uh, we've got a left-hand argument of A over here, a left-hand argument of B over here. So it turns out we'll be fine no matter which one we choose. So I'll do it here based on A, perhaps. And then if you want to, after this video is over, maybe you go back and try doing it on B and see how things change. OK, so I'll do it by induction on A. Uh, this time, so I see that successor of A down there. I would actually like to give it my own name, just so I'm not confused about whether I'm looking at the original name a up here or the, the number that's carried along that's smaller than it. OK, so for the base case, we've got 0 plus b equals b plus 0. Hmm. Um, well, I know that I could simplify, right? That gets rid of the 0 on the left. But as we learned in a previous video, to get rid of the 0 on the right, actually, that took a proof by induction. OK, well, we've already done that proof. What did we name it up here? We named it add 0r n plus 0 equals n. So we could rewrite with add 0r here. Rewrite add 0r. And notice the Emacs proof general is giving me an autocomplete here even that I can choose. So I'll just do that. Rewrite with add 0r. And that replaced the b plus 0 with just b. Great. And now with reflexivity, we're done. OK. You might at this point in the proof have noticed that b equals b plus 0 is, in fact, exactly the theorem add 0r. Let's go up and look at it again. Although we've changed the variable name, it's just an instantiation of n with uh, b. 
So you might wonder, could I just say like, that's exactly the theorem I want. Do I really have to use rewrite? Yes, there are ways to apply theorems um, without having to do the step of the rewrite. I'm getting a little ahead of myself again there, uh, but the tactic you're looking for is named apply. Uh, we'll cover that in a future video. Okay, then we're done with the base case. That base case was a little more complicated than some we've seen so far. It required the use of a, an extra lemma or theorem there. I like to call those helper lemmas sometimes because they're helping us to prove other results. Okay, what about the inductive case? Well, this looks a lot like some of the proofs we've done already. Uh, we'll notice that we've got a successor and a plus here. We're used to the fact that that could simplify. Okay, and now we've got a prime plus b. A prime plus B it looks like we could rewrite with that inductive hypothesis. Now we've got successor of B plus A prime and B plus successor of A prime. Hmm. What could we do with that? I feel kind of stuck here when I look at this goal. Uh, I don't see any way that I could further manipulate any of these terms here with the information I have in the context. I've done all the rewrites I can do, but I'm at a point where reflexivity isn't going to work. This is a point at which it can sometimes be helpful to take that goal and make it its own theorem that you try to prove, its own uh, helper lemma, if you will. So we want to maybe prove a, another theorem here that says, oh, let's see. Well, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet. Let me, let me come up with a name in a second here. But for all A and B of type nat, uh, I had the successor of a plus b was equal to a plus the successor of b. And yeah, I should choose a name for that. Let's call that plus uh, a s b maybe, because that's what the name, the, the organization of those terms looks like on the right hand side. We've got a and the successor of b. Okay. Now recall that in fact, if I were to fully parenthesize that, that successor constructor is binding more tightly. And even if I do that, cock is gonna take out those parentheses because they're not strictly necessary when it prints that back out. But I'll keep them there just so we can see them. Maybe that's helpful to understand it. Okay, how are we going to prove this? Uh, maybe, and this is a technique I use a lot, maybe I just say it's admitted for now and I go back down and make sure that I'm proving a lemma that can even, even work at all for me. Like, did I prove the right thing at all? So if I try to rewrite with a uh, plus a S B there, what have I got? Yeah. So it changed the left hand side of this to be exactly what I wanted uh, because it swapped them around. Uh, let's look at that. It swapped the two variables that are internal there and moved the successor. Now at this point, it's maybe getting confusing. What are the A's? What are the B's in this? So to, uh, to maybe make that a little easier to follow, I could choose some different names at this point. Maybe I could choose N and M. Yeah, I know, they sound a lot alike, but there's a method to my madness here. In fact, this is a theorem proved in Software Foundations and in the standard library, and then you use a pretty similar naming convention, so I might as well do it myself for now. Okay, so N and M. Now let's go back down here. I should really call this plus n s m at this point, and I will have to rewrite with plus n s m. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Before doing the rewrite, we've got the successor of b plus a prime. So n is gonna be replaced by b, m is gonna be replaced by a prime. I want to rewrite that so that the left-hand side of the plus comes out front. Yep, that B comes out front, that's what I want. And the right-hand side of the plus uh, should in fact end up with a successor in front of it. So let's see, the A prime is ending up on the right here with a successor in front of it. So that's exactly what I wanna have happen. That's great, because that means I have the right lemma factored out and I ought to be able to finish that proof by reflexivity. Great, I can, QED, that proof is done. Uh, but of course, I haven't proved the theorem up here that I need to prove. Now, by the way, you might feel a little bit queasy here. Why did Cock let a QED go through when, in fact, there's a, a, a lemma that this is relying on that hasn't been proved yet? It's not a big deal. There is a way to query to find out what unproved assumptions any uh, proof is, is, is based upon. And we could do that for ADCOM to figure it out. Uh, I won't do that right now. Okay, let's prove the lemma, though. Okay, so I want to prove that uh, I can 
play around with the successor and push it in and out in this way. Okay, start by introducing N and M. Um, and now, this is another opportunity to do proof by induction, as it turns out. Uh, I happen to know that because I have done this proof before. Uh, it's not necessarily something you would guess right away again. Learning when to use induction is part of learning cock. Uh, the reason it might be reasonable to use here is that you can see you've got something involving plus. Plus is defined recursively, so you might need induction. If you started off by using destruct and got stuck, you would probably get stuck at a point where you realized, oh, I need another instance of the same theorem I'm proving. That would be a clue that you needed induction. Okay, let's do induction on n here. And as usual, I will give the interior variable a name n prime. Okay, so for the base case, let's see. Well, that should simplify at this point. And in fact, uh, great, it simplifies to exactly the same term. If I undo that simplification, what did, what did I have? I had the successor out front of a zero plus, but the zero plus is gonna simplify. Just get rid of that, becomes M, and so reflexivity does it. Now, of course, I could have done the whole thing with just reflexivity. We learned that in a previous video. Okay, now what about this case? Uh, we've got something that looks Vaguely similar here to the inductive hypothesis, but it's not exactly the same yet. We could try simplifying, and maybe you see what would simplify already. That interior plus is what simplifies, because we've got successor of something plus, we've learned that that's going to simplify. Okay, now we have exactly the left-hand side of the inductive hypothesis showing up in two places here. So let's rewrite with that. And look at that. Now we end up with exactly the same term on both hand sides of the equality. So reflexivity will finish our proof. Cool. So it took a helper lemma and we were able to prove that add is commutative, a fact that you and I take for granted. And now we've verified it for cock. <laughs>